heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So, for those of you that are newer to Tove today, maybe what you didn't know is before the summer, uh, we begin a journey through the Gospel of Matthew. And so we went through Matthew verse by verse, and we were in Matthew week 30, and then we took a break during the summer through the minor prophets. It was a very depressing summer for Tove Church, and then today we kick off on week 31 uh, to kick off our second year, and we finished chapter 10 before summer, and we kick off chapter 11 today, and what a chapter it is. So let's just jump right in. If you have your Bibles with you, it will also be on the screen. We'll be in Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 11, and this is the Word of God. It says, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John, John the Baptist, heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame will walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf will hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one, this is great, who is not offended by me. Okay? As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? What did you think you'll see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? That'll be a fun one. Uh, behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than the prophet, this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare a way before you. Truly, this is a staggering statement. Truly, I say to you, among those born of woman, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So, hear me. That's a staggering statement from Jesus. He says, of all the humans born from a woman, naturally, there's no one greater than John. Right? If I took a poll today, who do you think would be the greatest person that you would say has ever lived. I, I have some pictures. I think, I think Billy Graham would be on that list. Maybe, right? He's kind of a big deal. I think Mother Teresa may be on that list. I think Martin Luther King Jr. may be on that list. I think Muhammad Ali may be on that list. No, he said that about himself, right? I am the greatest. Take him off, right? So the opinion, hear me, I would submit that we should care about the most is the opinion of who does Jesus say is the greatest. And he says here that John is the greatest. That holds some weight, amen, right? So John, Matthew 11, 11, he says, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. This is amazing, right? Um, Jesus says, among men, John is the greatest. Right? So I think it would behoove us today to examine this guy's life to see if there's anything that we can glean from. Amen. That's the plan today. So John the Baptist, if you don't know this guy, he is the son of a guy named Zechariah and of a gal named Elizabeth. Zechariah, his dad, was a pastor, so he was a PK in a small little rural town. And Zechariah and Elizabeth, they really, really loved each other. They had great affections for one another. And like many married couples, they were praying to have a child. Some of you in here, you're, you're praying for a child, and you've been praying, and maybe the child hasn't come yet, but continue to pray. And unlike Abraham and Sarah, Elizabeth and Zechariah did not take matters into their own hands. 
right? So John the Baptist, they continued, Elizabeth and Zechariah, they continued to serve one another and worship the Lord in the waiting, right? We're called to worship the Lord in the waiting, amen? We don't worship Jesus when we feel like it. We worship Jesus until we feel it. That's how we do it. And then at an older age, Elizabeth became pregnant with a guy named John, John the Baptist. If you know the story, around the same time, maybe months later, Elizabeth's relative, Mary, she conceived a son miraculously. His name was Jesus. So John and Jesus were kind of cousins, and they most likely grew up knowing each other. As you know, John the Baptist went into ministry first after 400 years of silence after the Old Testament. So no prophet for 400 years, no Bible study for 400 years, no church service for 400 years, and out come this guy out of the woods, John the Baptist. He comes out of the woods preaching repentance with a camel hair Jedi robe eating bugs. This is John the Baptist, but multitudes come to the woods. Hear me, if you can pack out the woods, you're an awesome preacher. (laughs) This was not a synagogue. He packed out the woods, so John was a gifted, anointed preacher. To hear the preaching, many got saved, and John gets his honor to baptize Jesus. And again, Jesus calls John today the greatest man Who has ever lived other than me? Uh, There's something about John's. I I don't know. John the Baptist, greatest dude who's ever lived according to Jesus. John the disciple is the one whom Jesus loved according to John. (laughs) Eh, I don't know. But with that said, John's life, let me say, doesn't really fit the framework of one we would deem great. Because you got to know, during this time, there was a political ruler. His name was Herod the Great, right? which makes a little bit more sense. It seems more accurate. John was poor. Herod was rich. John lived in the woods. Herod lived in a palace. And yet Jesus says, among those born of a woman, John is the greatest. So the question is, how do we, friends, define greatness? Because first off, let me submit, in America, we are a highly individualistic society. It's all about you. It's all about me. It's all about what you want to do. It's about you pursuing your fullest potential. If you want to be this, you have to do this to be this. It is all about your success. Your, it's all about you. But John, he doesn't do that. John He's part of a greater Christian heritage. John is carrying on this godly legacy started by his father, the pastor, Zechariah and Elizabeth, humbly serving God's people. John doesn't have a vision for his life. John has a calling on his life. And like I said again, John doesn't have a job. Because you can quit your job. But hear me, you cannot quit your calling. You can't. In addition, John doesn't evaluate his own life. But John allows Jesus to evaluate his life. Jesus says, he's the greatest guy. Not your life coach. Not your best friend. But Jesus says, John is the greatest So what I want to do again today is examine John's greatness and examine what made him so great. Number one, John trusted in the Lord. Let me read verses two through six again. Now when John heard in prison, so John's in prison for his devotion to the Lord about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who was to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and what you see. The blind will see, the lame will walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf will hear, the dead are raised, the poor will have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Notice 
John sent his disciples to ask Jesus some clarifying questions. Are you the guy or should we wait for the guy? Trusting in Jesus does not mean that you never have any questions. Amen? Some scholars will say that John doing this, sending his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the guy or should we wait for the guy, was John wavering in his faith. I just don't see it that way. So do most scholars don't see it that way. I mean, this guy, again, he's in prison because of his devotion to the Lord, and he's about to get his head literally cut off for his devotion to the Lord. And he's basically saying, hey, are you the one? Are you the one that they've been talking about for centuries? Are you the one that we've been prophesying about for years? Are you? Because if you are not, I would rather keep my head on my body. Right? But if you are, go for it because I know where I'm going. So he's supposed to make sure before I get my head cut off, I want to make sure you are the one, the fulfillment of all of those prophecies that were given thousands, hundreds of years before. And then Jesus proceeds to tell John's disciples, hey, go and tell your buddy John all you see and all you hear. The lame, they're going to walk. The deaf people, they're going to hear. The blind, they're going to see. The dead people, they're going to be raised. And the poor, they're going to have this good news preached to them. Jesus takes at least here four sections from the book of Isaiah. So Jesus essentially saying to John's disciples, hey, go and tell John, also my cousin, that everything that Isaiah said would happen is happening. It's happening. Some people call Isaiah the fifth gospel because there's so much Jesus prophetic language in there that it's happening. It's getting fulfilled. That God is ushering in, hear me, the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God was inaugurated with Jesus' first coming, and the kingdom of God will be consummated with his second coming. He's coming back, amen? Right? And we will get a glimpse, a taste of that kingdom life today. Sight to the blind, lame will walk, and some, some of you, the healing will come in this life, but for all of us, if you belong to Jesus, Everybody will be healed in the life after this life, but everybody that belongs to Jesus will at some point be healed. We believe this, amen. The lame will walk, he says. Some of you, you have debilitating pain. You have hip issues. You have knee issues. You have back issues, and it's debilitating, and we pray for healing, but also believe that in the kingdom of God, you're going to be running. Amen. He says also that the lepers will be cleansed. The outcasts won't be outcasts. The ones deemed irredeemable will be redeemed. The ones deemed cursed from God will be blessed from God. The ones who haven't hugged or embraced their spouse and their kids for decades will be embraced. And we pray for that. That tell, tell John that these people, instead of yelling, unclean, unclean, they will start yelling, I'm clean, I'm clean. Ushering in the kingdom of God. Right? He says the deaf will hear. Have you seen those videos of those babies? Right? They, they couldn't hear and then they get something in their ear and they hear for the first time. And the joy. Like that. Like that. The deaf will hear. And it says the poor will have good news preached to them. Let me submit to you. Jesus has a particular affection for the poor. Maybe it's because he came from a poor rural family. Right? And whenever we talk about rich and poor, I always need to clarify there's a difference, friends, between righteous, rich, unrighteous, rich, righteous, poor, unrighteous, poor. So there is an unrighteous poor where you're poor because you're just lazy. You don't work. Or you just go after these Get rich quick schemes. Or you gamble all of your money away. So you're poor, but it's because you keep shooting yourself in the foot. But then there is this righteous poor where you aren't lazy. You work hard. You're an honest working person, and yet you're just, 
You're making it paycheck by paycheck. God has affection for you. Right? Uh, and hear me, salvation, that's why salvation is free. Right? Not because it's cheap, but because it's priceless. It's a gift from God. That's why even at Tove, Bibles are free. Church is free. Little bit, even all the festivities today, it's free. Right? Salvation is free. Right? Coming to Jesus is free. But, but Frank, I, I've done this. I did this. Here's my past. God's arm of grace is not too short to save. So in a room this big, some of you, I'm sure, some of you in this room, you've done some horrendous things in your past or even doing now that God would say, that's not okay. That is sin. That's not a perspective. That's sin. That's not your truth, but it goes against my truth, so it's sin. Hear me. You're not beyond the grace of God. As long as you have breath in your lungs, there is hope in Jesus. And I pray for some of you that today may be that day of salvation. And Jesus will cancel the record of debt that stands against you. That's what's tattooed on my arm, Colossians 2. That you are clean and redeemed and spotless. Not because of anything you have done, but because of everything Jesus has done on the cross in your place for your sins and rose again for your salvation. It's available. Amen. But salvation is free. And then he says that the dead are raised. Right? And there are three, I think, occasions in the Bible where Jesus literally raises somebody from the dead. Jairus' daughter is one. The widow's son is one. And the most famous, Lazarus, is another one. He's saying, I am king over death. That if you belong to Jesus, death has lost its sting. The only thing death can do to you, friends, hear me is deliver you from here into the arms of Jesus. If you're blind, the first person you'll see is the face of Jesus. If you're deaf, the first person you'll hear is the voice of Jesus. If you're lame, the first person you'll run to is Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you belong to Jesus, this is as close to hell as it will ever get for you. Everything after this, it's joy. But if you don't belong to Jesus, this life in Pittsburgh will be as close to heaven as it will ever get for you. So enjoy it now. And that's pretty sad if I submit to you. Okay? But the dead are raised that he is king over death as Jesus raises them from the dead. Again, this is foreshadowing his own resurrection, foreshadowing our inevitable resurrection. That our life after this life is so much longer if we look at it in view of eternity. Do you know where you are going after this life? I don't say that to instill fear. I say this to instill a little bit of urgency that the worst thing is not dying. The worst thing is dying without having a relationship with King Jesus. And some of you, this is where you are. And I, I know I'm not going to say this on, a, on a, like a big Sunday where people come for the first time, but that's why I'm saying because you're here for the first time, and maybe you'll never step foot in these doors again. So let me just preach as a dying man to dying men. Do you know where you're going? If you don't know Jesus, it's either heaven or hell. There's no purgatory. Recovering Catholics. There's no you working this out after you die to see if you can get on a certain level so you can squeak your way into heaven. No, it's either heaven or hell. It's Jesus or Satan. It's light or dark. It's death or life. And Jesus is the only way. Okay. But everybody is welcome. That, that's what I say all the time. People say, Christianity, you guys are narrow-minded, bigoted, just to say Jesus is the only way is pretty hateful. It's not progressive. It's not tolerant. I would challenge you and say Christianity is the most inclusive and the most exclusive. Other religions, you have to be a certain race, have a certain amount of income, 
be at a certain status to get in. Jesus says, everybody, you can come. I don't care how messed up you can come, but you got to hear me, I'm the only way. I'm the only way. Friends, we are in, and if you think about it, we are in the same boat as John. Like John in prison, we need to also trust in the testimonies of Jesus like John trusted the testimonies of his disciples as he was in prison, that John was willing to die, hear me, for something he didn't hear and he didn't see himself based on the testimonies of ones who did. We're in the same boat. He he was willing to get his head chopped off for that based on testimonies. And Jesus says, I love verse 6, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So Jesus here, he's probably anticipating because he probably knows his cousin John well enough that John could be offended in the deeds that he was doing because John was in ministry. He was preparing the way for the Lord, and John was going to kind of drift away into the background and let Jesus take over. But maybe John, in his mind, he had a thought, he had a method of how how things Jesus should be doing things. And it's not, he's not doing it the way that John thought it should be done. And maybe some of you today, in the same way, your life is not going in the way that you planned it to go. That you have a massive script for your life, and you handed your script to Jesus, and he's doing a horrendous job in reading his lines. Because he's not God to you. He's a genie to you. He's a life coach to you. He's not king to you. Right? Hear me. If you disagree with Jesus, if you disagree with his words, if you disagree with the Bible, I'm just admitting you should probably change your mind instead of trying to get God to change his. But this is America. Everybody trying to get God to change his mind, and they will throw out every excuse, different culturally, it's not the Greek word, and they'll just do these things, and they'll try to make God change his mind instead of changing their mind. It's called repentance, right? And you hear me, some people, many people, even today, are offended by Jesus. I mean, he says he's the only way, so that means every other way leads directly to hell, kind of offensive, He does say certain things are sinful. It's not a perspective. It's not a lifestyle. It's not your truth. It's not your opinion. It's sin. He says there is demonic. He says there is a hell. And I'm submitting, instead of being offended by him, I'm calling you to trust him. Instead of being offended, trust him. So that's one thing that made John great is John trusted in the Lord and he wasn't offended by the Lord. Number two, John had steel in his spine. John had steel in his spine. Matthew 11, 7 through 11. As they went away, Jesus began speaking to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? What did you expect? A reed shaken by the wind. What then did you go out and see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than the prophet, this is the one that I've been telling you about from Malachi. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John. I would submit, based on today's text, John is one of the most devoted, fearless servants for Jesus. Uh, We're called to do the same if you belong to him. So again, John is in prison. His life is about to come to an end. John's ministry was less than a year. He was in and out. He made a loud splash, and he's out, letting Jesus take over. But his life was about to end. His head was literally going to be chopped off on a platter, and Jesus is now taking over. So there is a leadership transition happening here in Matthew 11, and the people, the disciples, are kind of asking Jesus, hey, Jesus, would you go on public record and would you tell us, what are your thoughts on John? Tell us what you think about John the Baptist. 
True or false, if Jesus was an insecure leader, he could have made John look really bad. Like if this were the days of social media, you imagine the rumors and the gossip and the blogs and the tweets that were going out. Oh, John is demon-possessed. He wears camel clothes and he eats bugs and he lives in the woods and he's preaching this babble. Right? Or if John loved God, he wouldn't be in prison. Um, but they're like, hey, Jesus, what are your thoughts on John? As this transition is taking over, would you make a public statement about John? And Jesus essentially says about John, John has some steel in his spine. John's courageous. Um, he was like, you're in the woods. So what did you expect to find? A reed shaken by the wind? He's like, did you expect a coward? Did you expect a pushover? Not John. John's not that guy. You weren't going to push John into doing what you wanted him to do. John didn't struggle with fear of man. He was committed to Jesus to the point of getting his head cut off. Once he knew he was the one, he is the fulfillment. Some of you, you're like, I'm committed to Jesus but my boss won't give me the promotion if I, I'm committed to Jesus, but this actually affects my bottom line. I'm committed to Jesus, but family gatherings are going to get a little awkward, so I want to stay away from that. Um, John was not a coward. Some of you, you're cowards. You say you're committed to Jesus, and any hint of opposition, I'm out. That you don't have steels, spines of steel, you have, you have a spine of a jellyfish. You, are, you, know those, you know those blowing things where it like blows? That's who you are. You're like, oh, you're, you're never stable. You're a reed shaken by the wind at a car wash. That's who you are, right? Um, but that, that's, I'm committed, but if I'm committed, I won't get this, so I'll be kind of committed. Hear me, I've said this before, friends, and I don't say this to be dramatic. Uh, this for the church in 2023, it is wartime. It's not peacetime. If you've looked around, and a lot, we have a lot of peacetime leaders trying to lead in a peacetime way during wartime. And let me submit to you, it's not working. Because peacetime leaders, they're already negotiating with the culture, not knowing that in the negotiations, they've already lost the battle. Wartime leaders, they are making sacrifices today for, guess who? The next generation. Friends, this is wartime. And John was kind of that wartime leader. He wasn't going to be pushed over based on cultural agenda or what the low-hanging fruit is, he was sticking, my job, my calling is I'm preparing the way for the guy. So cut my head off. Yes, my time is done. You take over. Peace out. Because I know where I'm going. This is John. Let me submit to you. We need more John the Baptist spirit people today in the church. These wartime leaders. And then he says, what did you expect a person with soft clothing? John was not in this fuzzy, wuzzy man romper giving hugs to people. That's the best picture I could think of. A fuzzy man romper hugging people. That wasn't John. He was scratchy camel hair Jedi robe eating bugs saying, repent, out of the woods. John was a man's man. John was masculine. John was not easily offended. John wasn't triggered about everything. John didn't have a safe space. His safe space was the woods. Right? John, he's a, he's a prophet. Actually, he's more than a prophet. He's the guy that I've been telling you about before the 400 years of silence. He is that messenger in Malachi 3. Behold, a messenger I will send to prepare with the spirit of Elijah. That's John. 
He's here. He's bold. He knows when his time is done, and he gets his head cut off, and Jesus takes over. John was committed to Jesus, amen? He's in prison, team Jesus. Head on platter, team Jesus, to the very bitter, graphic, cruel end. John was devoted to Jesus, and we also, friends, if you belong to Jesus, may I instill by the Holy Spirit some, some steel in your spine to stand up for your convictions. Don't be a jerk, but stand up for biblical convictions. Do not be a reed that's wavering with every little cultural push that comes your way. Amen? And then Jesus says again these crazy words, Truly I say to you, among those born of woman, no one has arisen that's greater than John. And there are some of you that would say, I don't want to aspire to greatness because that seems prideful. I want to pursue humility. No, you're just a coward. It's called false humility. I'm submitting, live boldly, aspire for greatness, humbly. Together. And this is a tightrope, friends, that we need to walk. This is a needle that we have to thread. Because the one who empowers you to walk this tightrope of living bold and great with humility, it is the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know the Holy Spirit? Do you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit? Do you know he's a person, not just an it, a force? He's a person. Okay. Jesus, John, rather, says later in the book, if you remember, he says, I must decrease, and Jesus, you must increase. Humility. And Jesus says, he's the greatest guy ever lived. He's bold. Doesn't waver. No soft clothing. Humble. Hear me, John was not living out his fullest potential. John was living out God's calling on his life. Okay. Hear me, culture and religion, I'd say, their pursuit of greatness essentially looks like this. If you want to be great, you should be doing this, or you would be doing this, so you should start doing this, or you should stop doing this, and there's no Jesus, there's no gospel. Right? That's religion and culture. You should be going to church, so go to church. Right? You should be reading your Bible, so, you, so read your Bible. Or you'll even hear stuff like, do it for God, as if God needed anything. Right? And hear me, parents, me included, we can fall into this trap right? where it's all about moralism, where either you'll have kids who hate you because it was all rules with no relationship with equals, which equals every time rebellion, or you raise a bunch of little Pharisees running around your house. Right? But we can fall into this where it's rules and morals and you should do this and you should do that you should do this and there's no gospel there's no jesus there's no relationship it's all religion it's all fear it's all you should you should it's all guilt or the gospel and john's pursuit for greatness essentially says this hear me hey you should be doing this but I just realized you can't do this. Thankfully, Jesus already did this. And he will send you the Holy Spirit so you can do this too. Difference. You see that, friends? That he gives you the power of the Holy Spirit so you can do those things too. One's empowered by you. The other is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Hear me. The only way you and I can live a great life is if we first live by a great power, the Holy Spirit. I'd submit that's how John did it. Right? If you read the Gospel of Luke, 
if you remember, while John was still in Elizabeth's belly, it says that John would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. You remember that? This, by the way, is why we also believe that life starts at conception. That he was filled with the Spirit from the mother's womb. And then later in Luke, it says that when he was a child, that John had the hand of the Father on him. So he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he had the guiding hand of the Father on John his entire life. All that to say, friends, John was able to live out this great calling on his life because he was living by a great power, and the hand of the Father was on him. Amen. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Do you know that he's there to help you? And give you power and courage and boldness and conviction and wisdom. And do you know you have the hand of the most affectionate father guiding you? Right? I've shared this before. I, I took Emery to the Frozen musical in downtown Pittsburgh. And she was, oh my gosh, so beautiful. Um, and we're walking in you know, the super safe streets of Pittsburgh downtown. And I, I'm holding her hand, uh, but Emery is just walking, and she's just looking, smiling, and she didn't see that sketchy guy over there. She's walking and smiling. Why? Dad's got her. Dad's got her. I'm guiding her. I'm keeping her safe. So she, if she would just trust in Dad, she'll be fine. So it is with us. The hand of the Father, he's guiding you. Some of you have been through the craziest things in your life, and you're here, and you're worshiping Jesus, and you're honoring, why? The hand of the Father, guess what? Whether you realize it or not, was guiding you, and you're here. And the Holy Spirit resides in you, and he wants to help you. Okay. Friends, in the same way, patterned after the life of John, as kind of a case study, that we all, if you belong to Jesus, that we all would live a great life for the Lord, empowered by a great power, the Holy Spirit, led by a great Father, the Father's hand. Amen? That's what we want to do. Ben, you can come up now. I was told i got to preach shorter, so we're almost done. Okay? Because we have a lot of fun outside. That we are called to live a great life Boldly, aspire for, aspire for greatness, as long as we have the right definition for greatness. John's definition of greatness, that he followed the call of God and he served people, he obeyed the Lord, he lived out a great legacy, aspire for greatness humbly, and the way we do that, like John, is that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit and led by the loving, gracious hand of the Father. That is also, by the way, how Jesus lived his life on earth. He was fully filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was doing the Father's will. Being a great man, being a great person is becoming more and more like Jesus. So if you are here today, and if you are not a born-again Christian, let me be very clear, because again... Pittsburgh has religion after religion after religion, and some of you are still in it, or you're detoxing from it. If you're here, and you're not a born-again Christian, you don't have an affectionate relationship with the Father, that you don't see God as Father, you see God as domineering judge, you see God as landlord, you see God as a force, but you don't see God as an affectionate Father because your relationship with Him was not a relationship, it was all transactional, it was all contractual. Let me say this, hear me, you cannot just do better and try harder. You'll get exhausted. Religion is exhausting. You can't just do better and try harder. You need Jesus to forgive you of your sin. You need him to give you the power of the Holy Spirit to empower you. And you need the loving, guiding hand of the Father to guide you through this crazy thing called life. So if you're religious, I want to free you today. 
if you've been trying harder, trying to be better, and even you come into church right after the summer vacation, you're like, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. Right? Maybe God will see this and he will put a, a star on my sticker board today. Some of you, this is your life. If you're honest with yourself, you're trying to do better, you're trying to try harder, and all you're becoming is exhausted or you think you're better than everybody else and you're arrogant and prideful. You need Jesus to forgive you of your sin or to forgive you of your religion. And he will then, again, give you the Holy Spirit to empower you and the loving, gracious, affectionate hand of the Father will guide you. In the same way I was guiding Emery through the streets of downtown Pittsburgh, he will guide you through all the knots and all the crazy turns of this life. Because here's what I'm learning um, more and more. And some of you that are older, you're like, yes, God, he never promised you an easy life. He did promise you that you will never be alone. And if you're religious, you feel alone. Because it's not relational. It's you do your part, then God will do his part. If you are here and you are a Christian and you've backslid, Today is a day you repent. And like last week, today is a day you return to the Father. And instead of being offended by the Lord, like John, would you trust in the Lord? Take that conviction, and instead of being offended by the Holy Spirit's power, change. Return to the Lord. Friends, I love you. And God's been faithful to me and my wife and our family and Tove Church for all these years. And he's going to be faithful to you for all your years. So let me just make an urgent plea before we end this. If you don't know Jesus today, man, could I, could I, would you give me permission to urgently plead with you? that he is the only way to salvation. Religion will not save you. Your philanthropic donations will not save you. You being a good person will not save you. You being better than that horror, that will not save you. Let me be abundantly clear, only Jesus and what he did on the cross for your sin in your place will save you. That's my heart, that you would come to know Jesus today. The same Jesus that John got his head chopped off for. The same Jesus that all the disciples and apostles were martyred for. That Jesus. He wants to save you. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Um, God, as I, as I preach on this amazing pulpit with steel down its spine, and I know these guys that built it didn't know that point two would be that John had steel in his spine. God, I pray for those in the room. They, they do love you. They do have a relationship with you, but they've backslid a little bit. I pray that they would return to you, Father. That you are not waiting there to squash them. You are waiting there to embrace them because you love them. That instead of us being offended by you like John, will we be those people that aren't reeds shaken by the wind, that we are not those that are wearing soft clothing so easily offended, but that we would be those men and women of God that have some steel in our spine to stand up for our convictions that are biblical. In wartime. And God, I pray for those in the room. They they don't know you. They're moral. They're good, nice people. 
they're religious, but they don't have that affectionate, Jesus, you died for me, thank you, that kind of relationship with you. That they are trying harder, they are trying to do better, they are trying to perform instead of resting on your performance on the cross. Because we believe the best man is a man at best. So God, I pray for these souls because none of us are promised tomorrow that they would come to know you today. They would come to know your amazing, good, affectionate grace today. They would feel the embrace of this grace today, that grace will no longer be just a word or an idea, that grace for the first time will be a person. His name is Jesus. That they would realize, yes, they are a sinner, but that you are Savior, and that you can save them today, and they will be welcomed into your family today. And you will start changing them from the inside out starting today. You will change their desires starting today. You will change their way of thinking starting today. And they change not so that you would be, you would love them, that they change because they know how much you love them. So Jesus, we thank you for this church. We thank you for these people. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your spirit. And we pray that you would continually allow the lampstand for Tove Church to burn bright for your glory and for the joy of your people. And we pray this in your good name. Amen. Let's stand up and sing, church.